Well, hello, uh, everyone and everyone out in Zoom land. Uh, I'm Scott Smith. Uh, I've got the pleasure of welcoming Casey Schmidt uh, to talk about uh, how to how to wield influence in the information environment. Um, Casey is uh, he's worked in a variety of intelligence and diplomatic assignments uh, for the government, including Cape Town, South, South Africa, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia and at Langley. Uh, he's a 2020 Distinguished Graduate of the War College, and uh, he also completed the Ethics and Emerging Technology, uh, Military Technology Certificate Program. Uh, following graduation, he became the CEO of Voxcraft Analytics, a firm specializing in automated media and public sentiment analysis uh, to entities including the State Department, USAID, and various intelligence agencies. Uh, I should also note that Casey just presented to our uh, three-star course uh, last week and was very uh, widely received and, and uh, popularly received. So welcome again, Casey, and thanks for doing this. Appreciate right. it. Great. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, I was actually remarking the last time I was here, I was in uh, SMP seminar uh, digging in the Clausewitz, and it was March of 2020, uh, and we ended the seminar saying, oh, we actually may need to go virtual, uh, and that was the last time I set foot at the Naval War College, uh, but, uh, you know, truly honored to be here. Uh, my time at the Naval War College was one of the best years of, of my career, uh, and certainly prepared me in this next venture of being a CEO of an open source intelligence company, trying to tackle some 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 pretty tough issues. Now, uh, today I'm going to talk about strategic communications in the context of uh, great power competition. I'm going to argue that the United States does not do strategic strategic communications very well. It does not communicate with foreign audiences very well. Uh, and that comes at the expense of our influence in the information environment uh, and our influence in contested environments writ large. I'm also going to argue that to somewhat turn the tide, uh, what is needed is a shift in thinking of how we do strategic communications uh, into highly tailored, uh, hyper-local strategic communications uh, that reach audiences, again, at these hyper-local levels. Um, the way people consume information, the way people receive information, and the way people communicate uh, is, is changing very rapidly. And I'm going to walk through a number of strategic principles and concepts uh, to help us think of how we better reach target audiences in places that matter. All right. Uh, so now everything that I'm speaking of today is going to be through the lens and the experience uh, from from Voxcroft, from this private company and the work that we are doing in this space. Um, my hope is that this complements a lot of the academic research that is done here. And of course, the very practical experience that information operators have, have in the field. Uh, but as a company, uh, we have developed what we call population-centric intelligence, uh, this new intelligence uh, tradecraft uh, to get at these questions of um, public sentiment, media sentiment, uh, how people feel and why pe people feel the way they do in environments that, that matter. Right, next slide. Good. Again, just real quickly. So we're, we're, we're a company that's a little different than uh, a lot of open source intelligence companies out there that are purely technology-based. Um, we're a hybrid uh, solution, so to speak, where uh, yes, we build AI solutions to do disinformation detection, sentiment analytics. However, uh, we tether these technologies to a global network of experts and linguists um, that are physically in these contested information environments. And that enables us to imbue into our algorithms and our machines that kind of highly contextual, contextual nuances in these information environments um, that are just super important to getting uh, highly accurate information. Next slide. 
All right, just real quick on, on the roadmap. So we're gonna basically five stages to this. Uh, first and foremost, we're just gonna provide a little context of uh, people matter. The information environment increasingly matters. So we're gonna talk about soft power, cognitive influence and strategic competition. Uh, we're gonna break into uh, connecting with foreign audiences is just really difficult. That's really difficult, especially from the context of US official communications and how you reach foreign audiences. Um, we're gonna talk about this idea of United States hyper-local hubris. Uh, there's a three level game of how you communicate with foreign audiences and how we reach the masses is just becoming exceedingly difficult. We'll, we'll dig into that. Uh, we'll briefly talk about how adversaries are essentially filling this void at hyper-local levels. Uh, a, a lot of this information that you uh, receive on, on on this point won't necessarily be new, but I think it will, will be interesting in the context of looking at U.S. strategic communications weaknesses. And then lastly, we'll dig into some solutions, some communication principles and technologies uh, to kind of boost our media profile uh, and resonance in particular environments. Next slide. All right, so people matter. Uh, people especially matter in highly contested environments, whether it's South Africa, Central African Republic, the Philippines, Vanuatu. Uh, the battle for public influence and cognitive influence increasingly matters to the United States. Uh, and clearly, a number of our adversaries are investing heavily uh, to try to gain superiority and in influencing public opinion and applying those psychological pressure campaigns uh, to ultimately impact decision-making and power structures uh, at hyper-local levels. Next slide, please. Now, so for everyone who's in NSDM right now or TSDM, uh, the whole concept of soft power, uh, the United States uh, has long enjoyed soft power advantages uh, around the world. Uh, however, um, and we're going to get into kind of why that's degrading, degrading a little bit. But I think the key point here is that there are a number of new protagonists that see soft power as important to their um, their strategic competition and in, in, in certain environments. Uh, clearly, China is investing a lot more uh, in trying to uh, boost its cultural uh, influence, uh, its soft power influence in, in, in a number of areas. Um, and even when you look outside kind of the main protagonist, uh, Bollywood in India, Nollywood in, in Nigeria, um, as kind of these emerging centers of gravity of cultural and media influence are gaining more prominence, so too are their influence with, with global audiences and it's essentially competing with the United States and its, um, its uh, cultural norms, uh, its, media, sports, entertainment influence that has long kind of carried U.S. Uh, democratic principles and, uh, and influence for, for quite some time, and it's changing. Next slide. All right, let's shift to looking at why is it so hard to communicate with, with foreign audiences? Um, so I believe this is actually your quote, Scott. So, hey, we can deliver missiles through windows with minimal collateral damage, but we struggle. We really struggle to deliver resounding strategic communications to the right foreign audiences at the right time. Next slide. Uh, advance it, please. All right. So. When we think about strategic communications and how it is normally done or how it has been done for many years from the US government perspective, I like to think, think about it as a three level game. So essentially there's three buckets of audiences uh, and our messages go out and we're trying to target number one, an international audience. So elites around the world, diplomats around the world. Uh, we have some desired strategic effects in terms of our influence with uh, with these these players that that we seek to gain from from those messages, 
And most of our messages that we put out are targeted at this level. Again, those diplomats, those elites. And it matters, right? Of, of course, it, it matters if, if you're going to do a, a fawn op, uh, what elites in other countries and other political leaders think about that fawn op. Um, but there's also two other layers of communications that increasingly matter. So the next layer is this national level. And I call this kind of the host government uh, officials, the elites in a particular society. Uh, our communications, especially when it comes from, let's say, our, you know, our US embassies uh, around the world, uh, do a fairly good job at targeting those audiences and delivering messages that are, uh, that are, that are influential. However, where we really struggle is this communicating to the masses. Um, and those local audiences, those target audiences um, that in many places contribute to networks that influence the power structures, the economic, the political, and the security power structures in, in, in a given country. And this is where US communications fall short. Why? All right. So there is, of course, the, the message in the, the messenger we'll get into uh, in a moment. But what is happening in the information environment at these hyperlocal levels? So on this screen, I, these are essentially communication platforms, ways for pe people to share information, communicate, highly disaggregated, highly diffuse. Uh, each one of those those platforms is a communication ecosystem in and of itself. Different ideological bents, uh, different interests. And this is what information environments are, are starting to look like. And so reaching broad swaths of the public, when this is happening, when target audiences are increasingly dispersed on all these different, different mediums, again, it's just naturally very difficult to decide and select which ones do we need to be targeting to reach a specific audience. Next slide. Great. Um, before I get into this one, you know, just talking about the last slide, I was actually you know, listening to um, it was a, it was a lecture on, on international marketing, and because of of, of that landscape, there's this whole concept that mass marketing is dead. Like it is impossible to have a one size fits all message that is going to reach large swaths of the public and resonate uh, and create economic value. The same is to be said about US official communications, right? A one size fits all communications approach where we're delivering one message that is then dispersed to just a number of different social media platforms is no longer sufficient in terms of um, winning hearts and minds. All right, so I wanna get, let's get a little practical and look at a couple case studies or, or vignettes. Uh, so as a company, what we wanted to do is take a look at uh, certain policy initiatives or events and see to what extent are they resonating and in particularly important environments. Here, so we we took a look at uh, the Filipino information environment back in November and December and of post um, one of the you know, big freedom of navigation operations in, in the South China Sea. A fauna, right? Huge political decision to uh, do a fawn up in the South China Sea at that at that time. It is a big U.S. strategic decision. Now, what we wanted to do, okay, to what extent was that fawn op having any type of strategic effect or resonance on uh, on the public in the Filipino information environment? What we found, and I know it's really tough to to read on on these graphs, um, but essentially. The FONOP and US security system writ large was only involved in about 2.5% of all security related discourse 
on this social media platform uh, at that time, 2.5%. And by security related discourse, I mean, essentially all Twitter X users talking about foreign policy issues in the Philippines for two months. To what extent is the United States involved in that conversation? Hardly at all. All right, why? Next slide, please. All right, um, I went through this exercise with uh, with the three stars last week and we actually took a poll, which is hard to do in this virtual environment. But uh, I asked them, how many of you had, have heard of PEPFAR? Uh, there was about 30 people in the audience and two people raised their hands. I said, okay, PEPFAR, US president's emergency plan for AIDS relief. It is 95% of US foreign assistance that goes to South Africa. South Africa, anchor state in Southern Africa, uh, hugely influential information environment, uh, a place where uh, strategically not doing so well, um, 95% of, uh, of US assistance. We did the same exercise. This time we took 10 years of HIV AIDS uh, related discourse in the whole South African information environment. And we wanted to find out, okay, what fraction of that discourse are they talking about PEPFAR? Now, mind you, PEPFAR is probably one of the biggest public health success stories, dare I say, ever. The amount of lives that was saved, uh, you know, 20 million lives saved since uh, the mid the mid 2000s, uh, what it has done to bolster health infrastructure across Southern Africa, um, the tangible benefits to people are incredible. I mean, talk about a soft power advantage um, of actually delivering results that matter to people. Incredible. However, when you look at how the, the information environment there and how people actually feel about PEPFAR, 10 years of HIV AIDS related discourse, huge impact, but yet only 3% of HIV related discourse contained any mention of the United States or PEPFAR. All right, next slide. And it gets even worse. So even, even with just 3%, we took a look, okay, so what is general South African media and public sentiment toward PEPFAR? Mostly neutral uh, and pretty darn negative. Uh, one third of those mentions have, have negative, uh, negative public attitudes or negative media attitudes uh, toward the benefit of PEPFAR and only 15%. So when you break that down, 95% of bilateral assistance, billions of dollars provided to South Africa, um, all those tangible benefits to people on the ground, yet what public goodwill, what influence are we getting with this public, with this program? Very, very little. Slide, please. All right. Kind of the last case study on the on the U.S. side, Ethiopia, similar to to the PEPFAR case study, you know, Ethiopia, anchor state in East Africa, long a U.S. counterterrorism partner in, in the region, um, and uh, I don't have the exact figures on this, but you know, generally a billion dollars of humanitarian and development assistance that has gone to to Ethiopia every year. How do Ethiopians feel about that? Uh, same deal, took large swaths of uh, media data and very, very negative. And you, know, you can read just kind of this, this quote or this little snippet there, but you can see the narratives that are in kind of general discourse about USAID and US foreign assistance. This whole notion of colonizer, uh, this whole notion that you're just using humanitarian humanitarian aid as a front uh, for uh, to compete against China or to, to uh, dissuade us from from working with with China, and that there just in general isn't a public understanding of what the actual intent of 
uh, humanitarian aid policy is in Ethiopia. That's pretty, pretty re remarkable. Slide. And I found this quote over the weekend in, in for, a foreign affairs article back in August of 2022. And meanwhile, in Ethiopia, this, there's you know massive you know Chinese uh, financed construction everywhere. Um, you know, huge effort on uh, Ethiopia being a, a critical Belt and Road uh, initiative country for China, and there's lots of advertising. But how the Ethiopians talk about it with these very tangible benefits uh, that the, the Chinese are providing, um, highly positive. I don't have the exact figures on it, but general Ethiopian sentiment toward China is, is very high. But what was remarkable to me in this is what's highlighted in orange. And where are their Americans? All right, so I served in Ethiopia. I mean, the Americans are everywhere. U.S. assistance is everywhere with very tangible benefits to the public all across the country. Yet, again, just not resonating. There's not that connection between what you, the intent of U.S. policy and building that goodwill on the ground. Next slide. All right. So shifting to you know looking at adversaries and their strategic communications um, and just kind of highlighting some of the, the things that it does well to uh, increase its profile and resonate in particular information environments. So I think first and foremost, what China does pretty well from our perspective is it has very strong practical narratives about the benefits of Chinese cooperation. Uh, it doesn't matter if we're talking about Ethiopia, Vanuatu, Bolivia, it's the same narratives everywhere about it being an economic powerhouse and an economic alternative to, uh, to the United States and uh, uh, the Western, Western led economy. Um, I think my favorite one here, this peaceful alternative to, to the West, uh, it is pretty remarkable how whatever is happening in, in the world, China will comment, comment on it and link it to kind of U.S. being the United States being this this warmonger, while China is the, the peaceful protector of, of global global order. And this other narrative of being very pro poor and development focused. When you look at a lot of their communications, it is very population centric. It is very again protector of, of the poor, and you just see these tight narratives everywhere. And again, I put pragmatic in, in quotes because um, when you look at kind of official Chinese communications, they want to be this very pragmatic, uh, they want to have this pragmatic messaging style or these pragmatic narratives that kind of counterbalance US narratives, which tend to be very ideological. Um, so next slide, please. And so offensively, what we also see, again, I talked about this warmonger narrative, um, but China also does a good job of taking issues and framing them in a way that essentially make the United States look bad in, in particular information environments. So again, you could just look at hashtag warmonger on, on, on Twitter X. You'll see it pretty much in every single Belt and Road uh, um, uh, information environment and their conversations. This is especially true in Africa, the whole colonialist nar narrative and you know, protectors uh, being very anti-colonialist. Um, you just, you see these narratives everywhere. Next slide. All right. And what we also see China doing pretty well is its soft power promotion we have, again, these very localized media vectors. Uh, this one here is it's, it's the front page of a very prominent uh, South African uh, newspaper, I believe in Cape Town, um, front page. And again, it's, it's it, print media in, in South Africa is actually very widely read, particular, uh, it, it seems that this particular uh, 
Vector was chosen very deliberately to target a, a very specific audience at a very specific time or with different political events ha happening. And again, it was just, it was a really strong vector for getting a very certain message out and they do this quite well. Next slide. And just wanted to just kind of comparing apples to apples. Uh, we just did a big, U.S. Chinese trade and investment project in in Kenya uh, and looking at media resonance there, and the sheer profile. Um, even though, again, in in Kenya, uh, the United States has a big bilateral push to increase U.S. trade and investment in Kenya. Lots of humanitarian assistance. Kenya has long been a strong partner uh, for the United States, uh, but Kenya is also um, a key. Uh, BRI pillar for, for for the PRC, but when you look at the information environment, who has a bigger profile and who is resonating more strongly? Uh, you know, clearly China at eighteen percent of uh, trade and investment discourse compared to US five five percent speaks for itself. Next slide. All right, and now uh, getting into. Uh, I'll back up and say everything that I've talked about before, um, at least from, from our perspective, we don't put that in like the malign influence category. This is just straight public diplomacy, strategic communications, uh, and how are they trying to wield influence with certain populations in contested environments? Of course, and again, I don't think we need to belabor this too much. There is a malign uh, influence uh, element to or what adversaries do in partic particular environments. Uh, this one, uh, we looked at, at the Philippines and uh, we looked at public sentiment toward um, the big initiative there of U.S. military trying to open up new military bases um, and strengthen uh, bilateral military cooperation with, with Filipinos. So we looked at the information environment and we noticed like, huh, on one particular, uh, this, this was Twitter X, um, one particular platform, very, very negative toward, toward the United States. We we're able to geotag where a lot of these tweets were coming from. And we found, huh, a lot of that negativity is pulling around exactly uh, with target audiences and the towns and villages near those proposed those sites. Um, we also have you know, algorithms that, that do disinformation and authentic account detection and found, okay, there's large, large number of those accounts were in fact inauthentic. And it was, it was very clear that there was an artificial campaign targeting those specific audiences with anti-US, anti-US military, anti-American content, again, to try to influence that public perception uh, and the power structures in those hyper-local hyper areas. It's a pretty pretty strong case study. This one? All right, so let's uh, uh, shift to some solutions. Uh, this is certainly not an admiring the problem um, uh, exercise. So definitely don't want everyone to kind of read this, <laughs> uh, this fancy graphic up here. Um, we can go to go to the next slide, but I did want to leave it on there. So if you're going to take these slides afterwards, you can have that uh, that graphic graphic to look through. So I want to talk about some strategic communication principles and also some technology concepts that um, can kind of help the United States think, at least certainly on the strategic level, um, of how how to reach target audiences in a, in a more meaningful full way. So. First principle, the right medium for the right audience. All right, so if we go back to that last slide, China was very, very deliberate in choosing Twitter X um, in the Philippines uh, because it knew, okay, there's a wide number of US military, um, uh, military uh, uh, personnel that are on Twitter, on Twitter in, in in the Philippines, there was a, a very specific reason for, for targeting uh, using that platform 
and putting that certain certain message out at the right time. Now, we we talked about how information environments are with the explosion of data, the explosion of platforms, it's it's very difficult to choose. But certainly public affairs officers, MISO teams around around the world, it needs to become innate in all operations that understanding the various mediums, the vectors, who's on them, what their ideological bents are, um, and where are they most used in kind of geographic profile, psychographic pro profile, demographic profile, understanding those dynamics of certain platforms is gonna help give you some good clues of when a certain, you wanna put a certain message out, where is the right target audience? So I'll give you a concrete example. Again, this from, from the Philippines. Uh, again, looking at media and public sentiment toward U.S. military cooperation with the, with the Filipinos, uh, we actually found, and this this makes sense for a lot of folks that have done a lot of work in in, in kind of in developing countries, that broadcast uh, is often the the primary uh, information vector uh, for large swaths of of, of the public. And we found that broadcast had this abnormal, I, I would say, abnormal, uh, favorable uh, coverage of of such such cooperation, and it goes back years. Um, can't tell you why or how how this happened, but it is a sheer fact that um, if the United States generally wants positive coverage. Um, of its cooperation to to reach mostly rural audiences um, you know, in Luzon, like you're, we want those messages going out through these particular broadcast uh, vectors that uh, that are highlighted there. Go ahead. But other uh, social media platforms, very different type of content, uh, very different type of. Uh, messages that that needed to, that need to be promoted here. Facebook, which is the uh, most widely used social media platform in, in the Philippines, they don't talk about military issues at all on that platform. I would say this is just like this is the soft power vector. They talk about music, they talk about entertainment. Again, those kind of trying to build understanding of cultural values um, and music entertainment. Uh, that is where you're kind of promoting uh, that American pop culture, so to speak, um, which of course is very influential over time. Um, but Facebook it is that is your medium for a general soft power and public diplomacy. TikTok, uh, I know there might be a number of questions on, well, can't use TikTok, but nonetheless, TikTok, we, we found lots of users on there, highly nationalistic toward the Philippines toward the Philippines, um, pretty anti-China, um, and very positive on, uh, again, having strong relationships with, with the United States. Again, so if you're looking for a vector to put out messages and reach target audiences talking about the importance of US-Filipino military partnership, TikTok is a phenomenal vent, uh, vector to do that. But again, very different from Facebook. Next slide. All right, next principle, contextualize the message of seizing upon popular narratives. So if I go back to the, the Navy Fawn Ops and looking to why didn't the Fawn Op in the South China Sea in November resonate with Philippines? I mean, just like sheer proximity, you, you'd think, but what was happening in the world <laughs> in November, right? The explosion of Gaza and, um, and you know, the, the start of the war. And when you looked at all that media discourse about international affairs and foreign policy and military issues, it's just Gaza, 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 Gaza. And then others along. Um, there was no linkage between what the, the United States officially put out about, uh, about the fauna and stuff happening in the Middle East. How are you contextualize the message if there was one mention of how freedom of navigation in the South China Sea relates to freedom of navigation 
in the Red Sea or the Western Indian Ocean, uh, the Mediterranean, or anything related to the Gaza crisis, boom, that the profile of that fa fauna now reaches millions of people instead of you know a few a few thousands on 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 Twitter. So that seizing upon what are contemporary narratives, what are people talking about today, and linking that foreign policy action to what is happening today goes a long way of um, infiltrating much wider networks of, of public discourse and, and media coverage. Next slide. All right, contextualize the message, connect policy to local interest, right? This one is clearly intuitive. However, it's, it's, it's hard to do. Uh, but where all politics is local. Uh, just quickly talk about a, a study that we did. Um, we had a, a, a task to look at, okay, to what extent is African media talking about climate change or climate policy? We wanna know all mentions of climate change and climate policy in Africa. And just those terms, we deliver bad news and basically said, you know what? nobody's talking about climate change. In terms of the way that Western jargon uh, and Western elites frame climate change and how they talk about climate climate change, you know, it is all up here. Uh, we did a separate study. We said, well, what if we start talking about uh, crop de degradation, locust, flooding, drought, disease, all the effects of climate change, all of a sudden, everyone's talking about climate change. And it was such a um, such an eye-opening case study of like you talk about climate change by not talking about climate change. Um, you know, talking about climate change to this gentleman and his crops in, in southern Mali, like just there's no there's no connective tissue between that message and what matters. Uh, to this person. But if you're starting to talk about U.S. initiatives to deal with land degradation in Southern Mali, and here's our policies that are doing X, Y, and Z, all of a sudden it matters, and it matters with a lot of people. Next slide. All right. Uh, reframing uns unsavory narratives. Um, China does this pretty well. Um, so this is a this is a Kenya example. Um, U.S. humanitarian assistance. Uh, you know, if you take a look at the one on the right with, with the red twenty percent negative, again, it's uh, for uh, white American officials standing in front of food aid bags, and that just immediately incited kind of these anti-colonial social media networks to just jump on that and just talk about. Here come the colonializers. Here come come the white saviors, um, and and then of course there's major amplification done by adversaries with bot networks and and just these narratives. Like that narrative is just flooding through the discourse and reaching audiences that we want to have a positive effect on of delivering humanitarian assistance. However, we saw messages basically on like the same day talking about U.S. De development assistance picture was different, the way that it was that it was framed of being very empowering to local communities, no US officials involved, had a massive, uh, massive difference in terms of how people talked about it, how they felt about it, and the extent that it, it started to circulate through the wider information environment. Next slide. All right, the communication piece. Uh, so this one's very near and dear to my heart because we're building language technologies for low resource environments around the world and very intuitive. Uh, so many U.S. messages go out in English uh, without nuance and colloquialisms that uh, uh, people in, in other information environments uh, uh, can, can understand. Uh, with hyperlocal communications, rule of thumb, it's got to be in those hyperlocal languages. If it's in Filipino, Cebuano versus Tagalog, you put out a message in Tagalog and in Cebuano. Uh, it's, it's that simple. And when that happens, the resonance and the profile of those messages, and again, you're starting to reach millions of people, not just hundreds. 
slide. All right, um, engaging key influencers. So I was actually looking at a, uh, a Boston subway, the T, the T map um, yesterday. I'm like, oh, you know, this is actually just like a social network map. And when you think about it, when you think of a, when you think of a, a subway map, uh, there's certain stations where lots of lines come in and lots of lines go out. And of course, those stations are the ones that generate the most economic value. Um, social network analysis is the same. Like, the folks where the, the, the bubbles are, are the biggest have the most amount of users and the most lines coming into it and going out of it are the, are the ones that are the most influential in terms of shaping narratives on, on a particular topic. Now, it's kind of hard to see here, especially for you who are in the audience, but on the right side, there is a kind of a smaller red, um, red cluster uh, of users. That's for an official U.S. embassy account, and it's very disconnected from essentially everything else. Whereas the one in blue, um, it is connected to everything. And so it's essentially three users that are driving the narratives and driving discourse on particular topics. Um, public affairs officers, MISO teams, when you're thinking about um, who to engage, you run through these exercises to identify, okay, these three users right, have to be engaged, um, have to be following you. And if they do, again, all of a sudden, you're immediately amplifying your message and your narrative into places that previously weren't there. Slime. All right, on the defense side. So refute damaging narratives in real time. All right, so with the amount of misinformation and disinformation that is out there, it's impossible to respond to every single um, piece of, of disinformation. However, there are times where disinformation is truly damaging to the U.S. narrative, to the U.S. to the U.S. brand, and to U.S. objective in, in a particular country. And in that case, like there just needs to be an immediate response from whomever's in charge on a certain platform. So I put this example up from uh, on China side. Immediate, immediate response to. Uh, a particular narrative that they felt that was unsavory. I would I've certainly never recommend on the U.S. side using <laughs> China's language, but the whole point was like, it immediately responded. It immediately tried to reshape the narrative. And it's just, it's involved, right? It is like dialectic. It is discourse. It's not static where it's just going to put out one message and we're going to see what happens and see its response. Like it is just, it is in it. It is active discourse with the public and just shows like having that active discourse, you know, that is the posture that you need to, uh, uh, to be able to defend against these, these counter narratives to U.S. interests. Next slide. All right, indirect messaging. Um, so if I go back to the last slide, I said I wouldn't recommend um, such like strong language against China. And that's not because I'm a China apologist or anything. It's just the data suggest it doesn't work. Uh, when the United States goes on the offensive and deliberately tries to point out all the bad things that China is doing, it doesn't resonate too well um, and incites uh, pretty significant backlash um, in, in certain places. What does work, however, is when you look at um, what drives negative sentiment toward, toward China, it gives you clues of the types of narratives that you can be driving over time and that become very influential in the minds of, of the public. So here in Fiji, you know, we see, okay, media freedom, corruption, uh, and military security in Oceania. It's just generally highly negative public reaction to China's role in, in those things. And those are clues, right? Um, you know, in fact, we're working with uh, several U.S. embassies right now thinking about, okay, how do we build a communications campaign around corruption in, in Africa? This is just constantly an issue that people, so, and it's not a campaign to say, oh, China, you're so corrupt. 
it's a campaign to say, okay, look at how the United States does business. Yeah, we just launched this trade and investment deal. Look how business was done with transparency, uh, openness, uh, you know, essentially no corruption here. And so you're offsetting, you're basically building on that negative sentiment by showing that you are this, you know, this counter narrative, this, this counterbalance to the solution uh, to corruption concerns in those societies. Next slide, just got a few more. All right. Uh, probably my favorite and you know certainly a, a good message for uh, everyone here at, at the War College. When you're thinking about strategic communications, and public messaging, especially at the, cam at the campaign level, something you're going to do over time, it doesn't always need to be the United States. Um, other partners in different information environments have, uh, have advantages that, that we don't. Um, this particular in instance, it, um, it was some security issue in, in the South China Sea, and uh, I believe it came from Solomon Islands. Um, and just general public sentiment toward what the Australians were doing and what the Japanese were doing had a much higher profile and were resonating very strongly. And again, were the same values, same military objectives, same foreign policy objectives as the, those partners. And so in many cases, it's coordinating with these um, of trying to put official communications out through them versus doing it, doing it by yourself. Next slide. All right. So yeah, you have kind of three key takeaways. Um, you know, the United States struggles uh, at reaching those hyper-local audiences. Strategic communications are the connective tissue between policy action and generating and building public goodwill on, on the ground in information environments that, that matter. And it is just that those hyper-local communications, that hyper-local engagement, uh, that is really going to help be, become that, um, that, that connective tissue. We talked, we, we definitely uh, dug into kind of those modern communications, uh, communication concepts that can you know, help, help us better compete in, in, in these places. Um, get more a higher profile, uh, more, more resonance, and ultimately increase our competitiveness in, in the information environment. We're approaching the end of our time, so I think, uh, yeah. excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.